from the booklet Mysteries of the Pyramid of David H. Lewis from New Jersey, USA, who has spent countless years studying ancient transcripts, hieroglyphics, etc. Preface The author here claims that an unknown secret entrance to the Great Pyramid was at last found on the basis of instructions and intricate codes found in a type of under-earth tomb in 1936. These code findings were east of Athena, but the statements were not correctly decoded until many years later, he claims. Yes, it was not before June 76 that a small group was able to enter these enormous underground chambers lying deep under the pyramids on Giza. They claim to have taken thousands of microfilms of what they found, things that prove far distant ET visitations, underground civilizations, and far developed societies on Earth. It may seem as a fantastic claim or a big bluff, but remember that if this should be true, the conservative scientific society and the might powers in position would do all to hide or stop these things from being revealed. This is not groundless claims, because the now released reports from the Disclosure Project shows very clear what the men in power has so well covered and denied ET visitations and similar the last 60 years or more. Another might power that try to prevent these discoveries to come forth is the mighty churches and the Western religions, and the author here was also a strong influenced of this as most of the Americans seems to be in many ways. He was a son of a priest. There might would weaken a lot if proven discoveries would show that God did not make create earth, and humans, as said literally in the Bible some few millenniums ago. Another thing to remark, like some spiritual sources say, is that so-called evidence that is too convincing is not allowed to come forth from the spiritual control plane, because evidence is something the ripe seeker must and will recognize inside him or herself, when he or she is mature. Therefore, it is to consider that, like in this case, the society was not yet mature for this to come forth until time is right. It is also interesting that other sources, as Lobsang Rampa, and some physical ET contact persons told similar things that the claims here says. Some words are translated and some headlines added. There may be word mistakes as text is scanned. Here is some from the epilogue first. This unusual venture into these secret chambers was costly, not only in a monetary aspect, but in the four lives that were lost in the few short years that followed the expedition. Due to this entry and the information gained, although nothing was removed from these chambers, the microfilms have since proven to be a precise entity to those who place money in a higher regard than human life. It is entirely doubtful now that these microfilm clips will ever be displayed for the general public and will remain as guarded as a spacecraft now in captivity at our Air Force base. The records within this tomb are as near endless as time itself, and had all these discs and plates been photographed, instead of the mere 2700 that were taken, we may now have been able to conquer the many fears that befall every man. We may have gained enough basic knowledge to now prolong our total demise changed the lifestyle of all those on earth, prevented the mass of starvation now engulfing the world, found cures for cancer and other ills that plague mankind, and eventually accomplished a new race of greedless people. Had we dug deeper with more photographs, we may have discovered the secret of the anti-gravitational machine, perfected the laser for our new and improved society, accomplished terrestrial travel, produce tiny wafers that would supply a multitude with the proper nutrition, thus preventing hunger among the needy. And last but far from least, we may have found a sound use for telekinesis and teleportation. What you have read in these preceding pages is not only the basic truths of the, of the expedition, 
but only a brief scanning of the overall data retrieved. Since our pyramid is evidence of our past and can never be duplicated, we can actually say that Noah's Ark, the UFOs, and Atlantis fit the same category of the higher technologies of the once advanced civilizations who inhabited our Earth. Therefore, if these basic truths are now visible, how could one deny the contents of this tomb or the fact that such a tomb exists? It is not all that difficult to imagine the technologies of our ancients in a comparison to ours. Their advancement was based on supreme knowledge handed down for millions of years, while our advancement is based on the bodies we must tramp upon to gain just a minor degree of advancement. Passage to the Tomb What you are about to read may surprise some, offend many and create disbelief among the rest, but what you are about to read is fact that has resulted from an actual expedition into the great secret and forbidden chamber, built by a superintelligent race many centuries prior to the present belief that Adam and Eve were the first humans planted on this earth. To all those with a deep religious conviction, I am not presenting these founded facts in a sacrilegious manner when I make reference to Adam and Eve not being as per Bible translation by your standards of reasoning. Just weeks prior to this expedition's discovery of the hidden entrance on the outer shell of the pyramid, a caravan of scientists from a California university had just completed their external examination of this structure using a cosmic and gamma ray gamma x-ray device to determine whether or not Giza was hiding any secret passages or rooms that were undetected from the internal viewing. When these rays were focused on the pyramid, any solid portion would immediately bounce these rays back, or be delayed should any inner opening absorb the rays longer than necessary. This examination did reveal the obvious delays for its normal inner passageways and its well-known chambers. What they did not know was the absorption of split seconds, millionths of a second, that actually indicated a secret stairway running directly behind the king's and queen's chamber. For here we are speaking of a large opening with only a 29-inch, 74-centimeter passageway directly in line with these x-rays. Such a narrow passage could obviously be missed and below these chambers. The structural casing was entirely too thick to emit such rays as far as in as the staircase was located. Thus this university experimental examination revealed nothing more than the usual inner openings and no inner passages. However, a select few people of this expedition, including this author, were well aware of a secret entrance and some sort of an inner passageway that up to that date in June 1976 had, had escaped detection from those who scanned its surfaces with the finest of instruments. As I indicated in this book's introduction, the entrance was only discovered after 40 years of intensified research, mishaps, trials and errors, and the interference by the Egyptian government officials. In entering the pyramid through the secret passage, one must accept the fact that if anyone were discovered during this process, either by the Egyptian officials or the guards of the, gar of the grounds, Imprisonment or execution would be the immediate order of the day with no amnesty for those who participated in such an atrocity against that government. To be brief, you of the secret entrances to the subterranean chambers, there are two unknown routes, now known to all who read this documentation. One such entrance is located near the top of the pyramid where magnetic forces play a major role in the actual door opening, exact location to be withheld. And the other being an under the base of the hidden tomb or chamber of records.
the exact entrance location near the top was not really pinpointed until a thorough examination was made of every stone within a range of ten terraced layers and every block between to the apex. Even after the ancient scrolls were translated, much difficulty arose in finding the exact stone that showed only a hairline crack between the actual cement fill and the stone itself. Simply walking past each stone at a very slow pace would not reveal such a tiny hairline crack, and for this reason, many frustrating months passed without a trace of such a block that would slide inward by a mere verbal command, using the proper keywords and vibrational pitch. They seemed to use a tape recorder for this, and had understood that it had something to do with sound after long interpreted the original scripture found in Greece. Our old remark. The exact entrance to the Temple of the Sphinx has also remained a well-guarded secret. Although after 10,978 years, it is now known to a select few. This temple is a shrine of extreme beauty with its breathtaking splendor of gold inlays with sprays of precious jewels at the secret altar, arches of unusual architecture, highly polished marble walls of a pinkish tint, and pure silver floor inlays of unusual hieroglyphics. Somewhere on the maze of marble walls and abutments lay a secret door and a downward passage to the tomb beneath the Pyramid of Giza. Today, both the Pyramid and the Sphinx are heavily guarded by a 24-hour vigil of armed Egyptians, and tourists tread a thin line around and within a structure. To enter from the top of the Pyramid's secret entrance, one must be directly in front of a specific stone, yet have an ample room to maneuver if and when success was reached, this one and this particular stone began to move. When two of the men were ready with the keywords and a belief they had the proper vibrational tones, no one was sure how such a stone would move, if at all. For the few skeptics that are inherited in every group, the movement of one of these stones was not only impossible and impractical, but also totally unheard of in any scientific theory. Thus they were certain that the forty years devoted to this research was in reality a hoax of some ancient who devised a scheme to thrill those who sought out the meaning of those scrolls, originally discovered just outside Athens, Greece in 1936. Although all members of this expedition supported some feelings of truth to those informative scrolls, still to a degree lean toward traces of skepticism in their deep beliefs. Before an actual attempt could be made in trying out various verbal vibrations, much preparation had to be taken under consideration. Research had to be done to clock the rounds of the parade and guards. When they were relieved, and when, if at all, did they discontinue their vigil? of the pyramid's exterior. It was recorded that each group of eight guards changed hands every four hours and were clocked for duty from 6 a.m. to their final dismissal at 6 p.m. This was a 12-hour shift, and since all tourists had to vacate the pyramid by 4.30 p.m., their last shift closed at the end of the 12-hour interval. Due to delays of various guardsmen, no move could be anticipated before 8 p.m. The one remaining guard at the pyramid's entrance presented no problem, since his position was at the opposite, facing to the secret entrance of the south wall. The first date for this unusual venture was scheduled for March 5, 1976, when the moon shed no light and would re remain for four hours. The first attempt was futile, and to the discouragement of the eleven who were on this private expedition, many more futile nights followed in rapid succession 
until exhaustion set in after their attempt of the 20th try. Many trips to the height of 450 feet were made regardless of the moon reflections. For inasmuch as they were never spotted, their attempts became bolder with each intended climb and toward their last visits there was little or no fear of being caught. A total of 37 attempts were made in this series of trial and error. On each trip, generally involving six members of the eleven, the key words were uttered in many verbal tone vibrations, yet they failed to get any response to an opening of the stone. After the third dozen attempts, frustration and more sincere skepticism began to seep in with all other mixed emotions. This repeated climbing finally took its toll among the members of the crew, and in the last few attempts, the number in the party dwindled to just three scouts who were of a die-hard makeup that would not quit. This climbing exhibition lasted from March 5th to June 6th before there was any inward feeling of success. It was the early hours of morning of June 7th, 1976 that, in the silent of the night, something was heard in the direction of this one particular stone. Searchlight involving only a piercing beam, and not a flood of light for obvious reasons, showed only tiny specks of loose cement at both its vertical edges, but nothing more. Since we knew every inch and degree of inches around that one stone, it was immediately apparent that this tiny debris was not there when the arrival was made. Some movement must have taken place and something created a strange sound. Other than these two unusual happenings, that evening of the seventh was totally uneventful. It was not until the wee morning hours of June 9th, June 7th by the lunar calculation, that success was achieved and by mere accident. Our voice recorder of tone vibrations was turned on accidentally when Amand Bu stooped over to step down and begin to make an exit. Results occurred immediately. This 15-ton block began to slide inward at a slow pace, creating with its movement a sound of stone rolling over pebbles, yet not really this type sound. The precise time was seven minutes past the fourteenth hour of midday. Fourteen and seven is twenty-one. We're seven minutes after two a.m. of the ninth of June. Apparently, as we reason later, the time divisible by seven of the exact day plus the correct tone vibration of the key words led to the secret of the opening. The stone block rolled, or slid, inward for a distance of not more than seven feet, leaving only a clearing of a mere three feet, ninety centimeters, due to the block protrusion of the underlayers. Instead of jumping at the chance to dash into the opening, hesitation was the theme of the next few seconds, due mainly to shock and total surprise. The decision was finally reached, and none too soon, and the three scouts hurriedly climbed down its pitch-black mouth, and just as the right hand of the third member was pulled free into the opening, the giant block slid smooth, smoothly over the underlay stone. The total time of opening and closing totaled just 35 seconds, with 49 seconds to its final resting place on the exterior facing. On entering, the lead scout, Amand Abu, had made a misstep in the dark passage and plunged forward down a flight of a dozen stairs. By the tone of his voice, one would imagine he had been seriously hurt, but as it turned out, it was only his pride that suffered the agony, and the dust that was suddenly stirred created a choking experience, delaying the descent for many minutes.
This opening of the stone simply did not occur after just 37 attempts from the first initial try, but was tried many dozens of times prior to being at that location. Eight months prior to June 9th, a mock-up of this area is reproduced, Hollywood style, in a secluded area south of the pyramid to the exactness of duplication. Knowing after all research was completed, the men that would enter would have limited time, thus this mock-up on a timer served as a proper evaluation to learn of the fastest way in, jumping, sliding, or squeezing in the allotted time and to determine after practice how many it would admit before the last few inches closed around them. Had this not been tried many times over, the first attempt could have been fatal for one or more. In the finalization, it was learned that time, if pushed for every second, could admit four men almost without mishap, and if any member displayed no hesitation, which was the case on the first real attempt. Still, with all this practice, no member of the team planned to carry food or water, and the first entering consisted of flashlights only, which was a grave mistake. Once this stone closed, the three expeditionists had been completely devoured by the pyramid, leaving those who were only half watching at the base in complete wonderment as to how the three disappeared from plain sight, who minutes before could be seen at the edge of the shadows. For those who did not actually see this disappearance still had a premonition it had to be so, and they had succeeded. The visual of the wait seemed endless, for no one knew if or when the scouts would return to the exterior of that south facing of the pyramid. The great stone block had now completed its 49 second cycle, and the chosen three were entrapped within the pyramid's secret passage, not actually knowing what they had done, why they had done this, and where such a narrow staircase would lead. They also had the sudden realization they had no food, water, extra batteries, or the smallest of first aid kits for arising emergencies. To prevent a creeping illness of their conscious mind, all of these thoughts had to be immediately dismissed, and since they were now entrapped on this inner staircase, there was only one choice and one direction. These three entertained verbally what they were thinking, which led them to expound on the idea that perhaps the stone would not open again by the same verbal tone, and especially from the reverse position. They did envision the possibility of being sealed up forever in a day and the fruits of their labor being in vain. Here on this darkened and dust-filled staircase, they wondered if these forty years of research would pay off and would they be benefactors of this unknown discovery. The passage chamber was narrow. Steep in the walls were of jagged cut stone. One wrong move against the sides could cut a man as quickly as that of coral rock and be even more infectious with the excessive dust, mildew, and a germ count ranging into the trillions. Once inside they knew what was so desperately needed to continue such a journey. For one thing, a flask of bourbon would help wash the dust from their mouths. Additional batteries, candy bars for extra energy, water, a camera and searchlights that would pierce the constant dust clouds. Nearly an hour passed at the top of these stairs, with each taking his turn, examining this unusual sliding stone. From all that could be learned, this block was not mechanical per se. There were no tracks, hydraulic plungers, wheels, chains, rope, electrical wiring or magnetic force, visible or non-visible. There was no way anyone could detect the means of this movement. The only unusual finding, and this was almost impossible to determine due to the position of the men were in and the cramped space was one groove cut in the center bottom of the stone. If there was some sort of an undercarriage, it could not be detected. 
As far as the possibility of electronic devices were concerned, this too could not be ruled out, for it could have been hidden at some inner portion behind the second terrace inn. Therefore, its operation remains a mystery to this day. Looking at the situation on a scientific basis, many secrets of our ancient past remain a well-guarded secret, and these people, who once inhabited a continent of great technologies, did know the intricate details of unusual electronics, teleportation, thermonuclear energy, liquid light power without the use of electricity, the unseen power of mercury and the art of levitation through sound vibrations. With this firmly planted within your mind, such a sliding stone remains a deep and darkened secret, but if explained, it would become simple facts of scientific logic. Once you have entered through the opening created by this sliding stone block, you stand in pitch blackness and observe a silence that is unmatched by a normal or abnormal circumstance. Once you have become adjusted to such a strange experience and know you are entombed, perhaps forever, your first reaction is a desperate and panic-stricken urge to get out. Breathe fresh air and leave this imprisoned and seclusion to another generation. During that first hour of examining the inner side of the block, the verbal keywords and the identical tone pitch were used over and over but to no avail. Such an experience to anyone would create an inward fear that once there, there was no return to the outside world. In such a darkness, even with the aid of three flashlights, you are immediately struck by an intense claustrophobia, which is only matched by the pungent odors of mildew, slime, and a near choking dust formation, that when disturbed, floats around you in billowing clouds that tend to close off whatever air there might be left to breathe. This point of entry was not too far from the built-in air shafts of the pyramid and an airway had to inwardly extend to the stairway, for if this were not the case, life could not have been sustained longer than the amount of air admitted when the opening was created. Even though no trace of air movement could be detected, there was air, but not the freshest of scents. It was breathable only when the dust clouds were kept at an absolute minimum, which was totally impossible. At this point of even a short confinement, you begin to entertain thoughts that no hidden tomb could be worth such an effort and sacrifice of one's initiative, and if the bottom of this staircase did lead to a tomb as indicated on those found scrolls, it just might be empty of these historical documents. For if we found such an opening, surely others before us could have done the very same, and this expedition could be in vain with three lives lost until some posterity of the advanced future. Your second thoughts become an even greater reality when the flashes of light reveal the sheer narrowness of the passage, the steep descent in the jagged walls of the limestone. These stairs formed a rectangular design over a large area within the core of the pyramid and carried you to a depth of approximately 980 feet, also, also divisible by the magical seven. From the point of entry, which was located 470 feet above the ground, this crudely cut passageway only measured a scant 29 inches in width with a headroom barely more than six feet. Each complete set of stairs contained 57 steps and at the end of the 57th a small platform was provided and against the outer wall one scant slab bench, barely large enough to seat one thin man. Why these slabs were pr provided remains a mystery for surely they were not designed as a resting place in an area where no one was ever expected to travel. The only scientific value it could have had was some sort of an inner support where it had something to do with the original construction of such a passageway.
and the journey down was more treacherous than anticipated, with each step creating a bellowing of settled dust that had to measure several inches thick on each tread. Between each minor dust storm, the pungent odors of mildew, slime cover treads beneath the dust, and stale air, the journey was a hazardous one. The main fear was the possibility of choking by the dust and slipping on the stair edges. The protruded slabs did provide some aid at interval steps, but was only adaptable for one man at a time, while the other stood on the inadequately ledged platform. Water to wash down the dust in their throats would have been worth all of the gold at Fort Knox, and it was a matter of concern if such a descent was to be completed, with its depth and destination totally unknown. The thought that originally crossed two of the minds in the beginning was a possible fact that this descent was not of any great distance, and perhaps in the translation it could have been a tomb room just opposite the king's chamber. Thirst could not be satisfied by the sipping of bourbon, for if so, and one sipped more than he should, the effects of the liquor could have created disastrous results with a simple fall on the staircase. If a fallen injury occurred, it may take days or even weeks to get out of this devil's den, and a serious injury could be fatal without any medical aid, water, or food. Therefore, this descent was one of extreme caution, and as a matter of record, each step with the wait for the dust to resettle took more than three minutes. This downward journey into the abyss of who knew where was one bad experience in which they were hopeful of never occurring again. This descent took more than ten hours, and an even greater apprehension was that these steps had to be retraced back to the secret opening. The climb down put these three scouts in such a complete state of exhaustion. By the time they reached the bottom, they had neither the intent nor desire to ever attempt the climb back up ever. At the bottom of this winding and jagged staircase, ten hours later, which could only be described as extremely tre treacherous and a death-defying attempt on one's life, they came to a small foyer, laden with many inches of dust on its marble smooth floor. This foyer contained one rock bench or a protrusion slab similar to those at each 57th step level. A roughly cut set of walls, an arched ceiling resembling a large half of a barrel shell, and one heavy gauge metal door. This door had no jam, sill, or hardware. It was a plain metal door that had all the appearance of sliding upwards in the side grooves provided in the limestone walls. How this was to be opened remained another mystery, and none of the three men had the strength to even think or hazard a number of guesses. Fortunately, the thought did arise that such a closure might operate in the same manner as the sliding block at the entrance. This door had no jam, sill, or hardware. It was a plain metal door that had all the appearances of sliding upwards in the side grooves provided in the limestone walls. How this was to be opened remained another mystery, and none of the three men had the strength to even think or hazard a number of guesses. Fortunately, the thought did arise that such a closure might operate in the same manner as the sliding block at the entrance. A verbal key and tone vibration had to be the only possible answer, for if these key words opened the sliding rock at the top, it should, by the same token, open the bottom. Two incredibly long hours passed by with no success, using the same words and verbal tones. The recording used had many variations, but all had failed their experimental tries. They reverted to the process of even reversing the tape, and in doing so, one very slight movement was noticed, but if the door actually moved, it could not have been more than a tiny fraction of an inch. 
Suddenly it occurred to Abu that since we were now at the opposite end of this passage, the reversal of the words should have been used in the same tone vibration, using the words urm, meaning light or revelation for the main stone. The reversal of this should be injected at this time. Another dozen tries revealed nothing until one member simply mumbled the word Genesis, and apparently he struck it correctly. The giant metal door slowly started on its upward movement, to the complete astonishment of all concerned. The sound was that of a motor hum, although there were no visible motors or electricity. Thus, if a motorized operation was its only means of movement, it had to be hidden above the door or the coiling of that room or foyer. It was now evident that once inside, this door should reopen by replaying the words that opened the stone at the entrance. If and when they ever reached the top of those stairs, more trials and tribulations could befall them if they were wrong in their theories of reversed words or its rearrangements of the same. Whatever device these builders used in this construction, the technologies were not only superb, but also totally ingenious, regardless of the time era. Beyond the Door The room that was entered from the dust-laden foyer had no lights, detectable air conditioning, or conveniences of our modern age. The greatest of many shocks was in the fact that beyond this threshold the floor seemed antiseptic clean, with no trace of even one dust particle. Just at the door, on the foyer floor, the dust piled up could better be described as a wall of snow that drifts against a doorway. To find no trace of dust on the inner side was not only a welcomed relief, but a mystery beyond any possible explanation. Before I touch on a description of its interior design and overall structure, I'd like to give you a picture of its size and the various room divisions. This tomb, apparently constructed thousands of years prior to the pyramid, because of its contents, was enormous in scope. Each of the four floors measured 300 feet square. Measurements were taken after the third arrival into the interior with a room height of not more than 14 feet. With four levels, the square footage totaled 120,000, or the size of an average factory in today's world. Each floor contained marble smooth walls, dust-free floors of a highly polished limestone, and stone divider walls for each specific type of historic record. Each alcove features its own arched ceiling of small cut limestone approximately ten times the size of common brick. At the south end of the tomb rooms on the eastern sides there were narrow stairways of the same 29 inch width that led from one floor to another. Each 30,000 feet of floor space featured a very wide hallway and the deep alcoves that ran off the center opening. The interior design was quite unusual, but in that a separate arched ceiling appeared in the central hall opposite each coved room. All ceilings arched from four directions and met in the center at a given point. No tracks of cement fill could be seen between these cut stones. The appearance was that of preciseness and that it remained intact by the pressure of the arched ceilings. In the four corners of each hall division, large columns aided the support of each arch. These pillars were unusual in design for the top. Their flare resembled no columns seen before. The large rectangular stones that created the top flare were concave banded around its center with a heavy band of metal of unknown material, as strange as it seemed. 
These bands of unknown metal were joined as any circular rim is, but without any trace of a weld. From all appearances, it was one solid band four inches wide and one inch thick placed in the middle of concave stones, which at the current time is totally impossible structure-wise. The entrance to these floors of the tomb is located at the bottom level of the first ground floor on the north's magnetic side, or its front wall, facing the same direction as the entrance of the Great Pyramid itself, from the direction of the Sphinx. This entrance was located midway on the north wall, or directly in front of the Grand Hallway, as it was termed by its discoverers. As you will note, there are wall divisions of rooms, with each headed by a limestone column. The floors, although slabs of marble, did have a high glow of shine and repeatedly reflected any direct or indirect light beam. The floor had all the appearance of being continually being washed and waxed, which I'm sure was not the case. Many of the partition walls were completely covered with metal bins also a metal knot of aluminum, steel, or related alloys that took nearly every square inch of space. And within these bins lay odd-shaped metal discs and rectangle sheets of tissue-thin metal, which seemed quite strange. This first visit to the secret tomb was somewhat brief, and no excessive investigation was done of these strange metal discs, nor examinations conducted of the odd type machinery located in various ante rooms. Since this was, in a way, an unexpected entry on the spur of the moment, no actual preparations were taken to scout the tomb any further. Leaving the tomb was relatively simple, and the reverse vibrational tones did work as hoped when the entry was made. Only two hours were allotted for this portion of the expedition, for there was that overwhelming anxiety to get back to the surface and get out. If the team was allowed out with the correct key, another expedition would be planned. Then, and only then, when the right equipment was at hand, could we continue with searching out whatever lay before us. Twelve hours had passed, and many times during this vigil in the tomb, we thought of our parched throats, and would have given all the money needed in exchange for one drink of water. Even a sip of bourbon could have crippled the long extend, and could afford this default. With the tomb door closing quietly behind us, we began the steep trek towards the top, and hopefully freedom. Once again, to keep the minds active and off the, of the hardships of walking these overly steep stairs, the conversation consisted of what would be needed on the next expedition, and how many men would be required to do all that needed be done. In mulling over all that had expired and the short notice we had in entering, it was decided we reconstruct something similar to this opening, and with the exact time allowed. See just how many men can climb through this opening before the stone closes. We pondered over the supplies we'd need on the next official expedition, and this list of items being hashed over and then rehashed, kept our minds off the hazardous climb and occupied the mind to prevent total exhaustion. The items discussed were those of several infrared cameras with a close-up lens, an abundance of water, suitable food of a dehydrated nature, meter, metering devices, recorders, a portable mine sweeper, and a compass. When planning any expedition, the trend is to overload rather than take what is absolutely essential, but in dealing with the unknown, no one can be certain of what could be essential on such a journey as this. When the three members reach the top of the stairs, they immediately reversed the correct tone signal and turned its switch to the on position. The trip up the staircase was an unbelievable short time and consumed only five and a half hours, which may seem rather lengthy, but when one is dealing with dust and slippery stair treads, the venture is twice to three times longer than one would anticipate to say little of rubbery legs. 
The total length of time involved from the very beginning to their final return at the top is now set at 19.5 hours. When the recording failed to cause a response, they were sure they were now mistaken with such a reversal, and from that minute on many combinations were applied. The feeling of both fright and frustration began to control their thinking powers, and before they went one step further, the men had to pause long enough to collect their reasoning powers, settle their nerves, and calmly think this dilemma through. After much thought, Amand Abu suddenly came up with the solution that since everything is in multiples of seven, so must it be in this situation. The time now totaled 20 hours and 45 minutes. If this theory was correct, and the magical number is in sevens, this stone should begin to toll on the 21st hour. Thus, a short wait of another 15 minutes, and possibly 22 if it is timed at 21 hours plus 7 minutes, as it was at the time of the opening, at the precise time of 21 hours nothing occurred. At 21 plus 7, the recorder was once again turned on, and this time it began to slide back, slowly but surely, and the scent of fresh air was a welcome miracle. Freedom was never as great and below them. They could see the other members of the party and their ascent toward the opening. When the three members reached the top of the stairs, they immediately reversed the correct tone signal and turned it switch to the on position. The trip up the staircase was an unbelievable short time and consumed only five and a half hours, which may seem rather lengthy, but when one is dealing with dust and slippery stair treads, the venture is twice to three times longer than one would anticipate, to say little of rubbery legs. The total length of time involved, from the very beginning to their final return at the top, is now set at 19.5 hours. When the recording failed to cause a response, they were sure they were now mistaken with such a reversal, and from that minute on, many combinations were applied. The feeling of both fright and frustration began to control their thinking powers, and before they went one step further, the men had to pause long enough to collect their reasoning powers, settle their nerves, and calmly think this dilemma through. After much thought, Amend Bu suddenly came up with the solution that since everything is in multiples of seven, so must it be in this situation. The time now totaled 24 hours and 45 minutes. If his theory was correct, and the magical number is in sevens, this stone should begin to toll on the 21st hour, thus a short wait of another 15 minutes, and possibly 22 if it is timed at 21 hours plus 7 minutes, as it was at the time of the opener. At the precise time of 21 hours, nothing occurred. At 21 plus 7, the recorder was once again turned on, and this time it began to slide back, slowly but surely, and the scent of fresh air was a welcome miracle. Freedom was never as great, and below them they could see the other members of the party in their ascent toward the opening. It's needless to say that when the group finally got together, much was discussed about this uncanny discovery. Plans were laid within the next few days for the second trip, and it was their primary concern to construct a mock-up model of this sliding stone to be assured of the number of men that could get through in the allotted seconds of time. One slip could create serious injury if such a stone should begin closing on any member and it would be futile to lend aid. The following 15 days were devoted to the search of needed materials and the start of the working model. On this first descent, we saw something that could not be explained fully, but then again, at that time, the three scouts were concentrating on 
only one avenue, and that was the stairs and the dust factor. It was not until this little expedition was rehashed in detail that we had observed, on this downward journey, two unusual doors. Located below the midway point and the furthest door downward was not more than three landings apart. Had the dust cloud not cleared for the split second it took to observe the side walls, these unusual doors of natural stone would not have been seen. The entire mental picture was not a bit clear, and seeing a cut stone could have been the figment of a wild imagination of that hazardous journey. And now, even as all was reviewed, neither of the three could really describe if there was such a cut in the rock or whether there was an actual door off the landing. The next trek to the tomb should reveal the truth to any possible hallucinations. From June 9, 1976 to the ending of October 30th of the same year, much had been accomplished in the preparations for the second expedition when they planned to remain longer and scan this tomb with a fine-tooth comb. It was their intent to try and photograph some of the area and examine some of the thousands of metal plates and discs. It was a stipulated fact that on the next visit to the tomb, a spray would be used on the stairs and walls to not only dampen the dust to where it would remain stationary, but a solvent of a non-toxic nature to, to dissolve the mildew on the stair treads. Another matter of urgency was the use of masks and aqualung tanks to be used in sealed rooms that might exist off this passageway. The equipment they planned to take was more than necessary, and with this added load, there was a distinct possibility that not enough time could be allotted in the actual entering process if equipment had to be handed through this opening. At a roundtable discussion, Sherman Stiles, chief engineer for the expedition, and Robert Simity of the Electronic Division stuck on the theory that at the time of the second opening, and assuming such had to be connected with electronic mechanisms of one sort or another, the recording of that special tone vibration could be delayed long enough to keep the stone open for a longer period than it was timed for. If some sort of a duplicate could be made, which was only a wild shot in the dark. This recorder could be set for a longer tape on that particular strand of notes, thus giving enough time for all members to slip in and drag with them some of the needed equipment. Not knowing how the stone slid back or its propulsion power, all experiments were hit or miss, and if such a delay could be designed, they would make an attempt to try it at the stone, but with no intention of entering. This experiment would be for time only, or to see firsthand if this was electronically designed. All forms of mechanical engineering was devised, using voice print devices, radar, sonar, for what it might do in case such electronics were buried downward below the staircase. Laser sounds, x-rays, and mine detectors set for electronic devices within a stone. These unusual experiments took many weeks of trial and error, and to be perfectly candid, more errors than trial. In the finalization of all experiments over a three-month period, success was reached, both in a duplicate mock-up and the fact that if this stone was electronically controlled, it could be stalled at its opening, but not for more than an additional 12 seconds. If their mechanism had an automatic safety relay, all of this, regardless of experimental time, would be useless if this device at the pyramid was totally different of anything on Earth. On November 3rd, the experiment began. Four members were present for this test, and all needed electronic devices were on hand, if needed. To have struggled up this pyramid's south wall with all that was carried was more of a trial of human endurance, and I dare say such would not soon be repeated. At the exact hour, plus seven, the tone vibrations were turned on and at a given point where the stone stalled at its fullest opening, the tone would be repeated every two seconds. 
At first, the experiment seemed to work, but the recorder and its tone vibrations only prevented its stay seven seconds, and regardless of their desperate attempts, it closed, but at a much slower rate. It was therefore proved that the stone was operated electronically, but our devices could not forestall its closing for more than these seven seconds. If this was all that could be accomplished, the time of entry was extended enough to admit one extra man, if he was fast enough, or four in total. The mock-up model, plus the experiment at the slide and stone, proved only one thing of importance. Four men, if all were agile enough to make a rapid descent to the stairway case below the stone, test after test was conducted, and it finally resulted in the fact that four men could succeed, but much of the equipment had to be scratched off the list. It boiled down to these scant few items two small pressure tanks of three gallons of chemical in each for spraying the dust, two infrared cameras, one small first aid kit, four powerful searchlights, twelve additional batteries, seven packets of packaged dry foods for each man and one canteen of water each and only one canteen of lemon juice used to prevent excess excessive thirst. All that could be stuffed inside pockets was essential, and what they couldn't had to be strapped to their front stomach area until they passed through the open and sliding in on their back. Once inside, these packs could be swung around to become a backpack. This was done to prevent anything catching on the stone lip and creating unnecessary delays. The second journey began at 7.30 p.m. on the evening of December 4th, 1976, and it was their intention to get to the location prior to the crucial hour of the designated time for the opening. Once at the area near the top of the pyramid, some gymnastics were performed to relieve the strained muscles of the climb and to limber up for their diving into the opening. The crucial timing involved here is not so much the immediate scampering through the opening, but to get down at least 15 stairs to allow adequate room for other incoming members. A law was established at the very last hour that if time became critical, and a fourth member may or may not feel he has enough time, he should immediately abort the operation. For those who were to enter on this trip would step aside on the third journey, giving other members the same opportunity of viewing the tomb. After 40 years of preparations, it was the general consensus that all who participated in this research, one way or another, should have a full opportunity to visit what they had dreamed of all these years. Only two of the original cast of explorers were not there and had been replaced five years prior absent due to death. The critical hour finally arrived. The exact time was recorded and the recorder turned on. All stood by with great anticipation and every vibrant nerve tingling through their entire body. Hearts pounded like sledgehammers on an anvil. Blood rushed through their veins as though pumped through a fire hydrant and with one member a headache began to cause ill effects caused by the excitement. This was the hour to behold, and if all went well, history was in the making. With all the rehearsal that took place in the last six months, one was never quite sure everything would go according to plan, and if all made the opening without mishap, it would indeed be a miracle to behold. The stone did slide as anticipated, and all went well. Instead of waiting for its complete clearance, fully opened, one member began his half-stand and half-crawl into the slimness of whatever opening there was, thus allowing added time when it opened at its fullest. All members made the jaunt in the normal time, without using the delay timer as originally planned. This would have been quite an achievement, if it wasn't for the fact that the scurrying created a dust storm to a choking experience, and even with the spraying, the dust wouldn't settle for nearly 20 minutes. 
Fortunately, this dust was not of a harmful vintage, and once it cleared long enough for the flashlights to penetrate the created fog, the spraying became effective for the remainder of the downward trek. The expedition scouts began to scan the walls in search of any cut stone doorway, had the previous scouts not had hallucinations. At the point of the 21st landing, a hesitation was called for. Here on their right, opposite the landing, a definite groove was cut in the limestone wall, and to reach it, had it been an open doorway, one would have to resort to unusual gymnastics, for this intended door laid over the open stairwell and could not be reached by stretching from the tiny platform. There was no doubt about this cut being the shape of a door, but it was not a door in the usual sense of the word. It was a perfectly straight line, seven foot high, across in a horizontal direction four feet and then back down to its normal chosen base. As long as the four were there, two on the platform and one above with the last member just below this point, the recording was turned on and every available combination tried, but to no avail. Nothing that was done budged this rock door, and with one hour passed, the event was bypassed until another revisit to the tomb. Two additional landings were reached, and this time there was an actual door that was set back from the landing. At first its visibility was not all that clear due to centuries of dust covering its surface. It could have been easily missed by anyone merely passing by had it not been for one vertical crack that lay open and free of dust and mildew. This, as I stated before, was a door and when it was lightly sprayed to prevent another dust cloud, you could make it out to be of a metal consistency. Tapping on its surface gave the rebound sounds of something quite thick and totally solid. It resembled the type of doors found in the Catholic churches in the Romans era. This door, like the rock entrance, was apparently sealed, and again no com combination of sounds would budge it. And with enough time slipping past, the journey downward continued. Of the four men, two had stumbled or slipped, and in trying to protect their fall in a headlong plunge, they scraped against the jagged wall surface, and as a result, both men were bleeding from shoulder to the hands and superficial cuts. First aid had to be administered immediately for the prevention of any possible infection, and their clothes had to be patched the best way possible under the circumstances. Thus, after this mishap, only two were in good physical shape, while the others had to find their own balance with their arm immobilized for the balance of this inner expedition. The long trek to the tomb was completed, and the four scouts of the expedition stood at the door. As before, the vibrational tones keyed the sliding in its usual upward manner. The two had done the introductory visitation, stood at the opening in as much awesome wonders as did the newcomers of the team, for here they felt they were taken aback in time and had entered the historical chambers of the ages where no other man had ever walked before, and the secrets of untold phenomenon lay as great golden treasures worth more than all the gold and silver the world could muster together. Here before them lay the end results of forty years of research, hardships, debts, sickness, and frustration, and it was indeed real, beyond the comprehension of man. Secrets of the Tomb As your movement, you slowly and carefully enter these secret portals, and as mentioned earlier, you are immediately greeted with the mystery of the ages. The path of stairs that led one to this chamber was inches deep in dust, slime and mildew, the most horrifying stench that ever assaulted one's nostrils and an accumulation of other smells that were collected there these many forgotten centuries. Once you got beyond the door, however, this was not the slightest trace of any dust particles, foul air, 
Meldu, or pungent odors. This chamber presented one of the deepest mysteries of our time, for it was nearly antiseptic clean, and for the second mysterious item, the air was more pure than the breath you draw on the surface of the desert 980 feet above you. There were no visible signs of ventilating shafts, wall or ceiling vents, or evidence of any forced air. Yet there was a constant flow of air, as pure as one could tell, from every conceivable direction. To have found such a sealed chamber, buried hundreds of feet below the pyramid, and for more than five thousand years, with no trace of foul air, moss, covered walls, or dirt, was not only a mysterious factor, but also a modern miracle. There, of course, were no lights, traces of electrical wire, or wall switches. For all that we could have known, there was light, but to find it was another type of an adventure. Along the south wall there were holes, head high, spaced approximately 21 feet apart, that had some type of a lens covering whatever lay behind it. Since there were none at the opposite side, it eliminated the theory of, a, of an electric eye device. Such lenses presented a further mystery, and during each mission there, every member felt we were being closely watched. These lens holes were on each floor, and getting close to them we found no traces of light, air, or sound. The buried treasure of ancient civilization is now laid before your eyes as you scan the room by searchlights. Without even knowing firsthand what the tomb consisted of, and only guessing from a standoff view, we knew these treasured findings were records of one sort or another of an ancient vintage. Aside from what was believed to be historical records, the broad scanning of the room showed even more mysteries, for on this first floor level were odd type machines that could never have been understood at a first glance or even at a closer glance. To have tried to figure out their meaning would require another visit to this tomb, which was already in the planning. The buried treasure of these ancients that has been kept from a public view certainly was not what the average explorers would count on finding, for there were no jewels, silver trinkets, or mounds of precious stones and gold. The real treasure, worth more than all the world's gold, lies in the form of recorded documents, well-chosen artifacts and strangely designed machines that could stifle anyone's imagination. Apparently, from what we could guess on that initial examination, the various antechambers were separated according to datings and other civilizations. Although we were scanning such relics of hundreds of thousands of years ago, everything within this tomb was apparently in the exact same condition as when it was put there and sealed. Nothing showed signs of age, and, and what wood was found, there was no rot or even the slightest signs of decay. Anything of a metal consistency showed no rust or even the mildest form of corrosion. It was apparent, as we looked around, that very little could have been removed from that tomb, and we were certain that this narrow entrance way was planned for that very same reason. If this be the case then whatever heavy equipment was displayed on the various floors had to have been placed there during the construction and not after. Another thing that suddenly became apparent was the fact that this tomb was a time capsule of a sort and in a remote way, similar to our capsules buried in various parts of the United States. Many years ago, more years than I care to remember, I was invited to a ceremony where our government was about to lower one of our time capsules far below the surface. This type capsule, more fitting to its actual name, was a heavy gauge cylinder, shaped similar to oxygen tanks. Before the cap was placed into position, sealed and lowered, the following contents were placed inside. The government placed in each time capsule the following article, coals one Bible, one updated history book consisting of all world events, one medical book listing the ills and treatments, a copy of our Constitution and copies of all man-made laws up to the date of 1932, 
church hymnals from the Catholic, Jewish, and Protestant churches, a map of the United States, paper money, gold and silver coins, a list of nearly every worthwhile invention, with pictures, the story of flight and their project to conquer far-reaching planets, a list of our wars and the outcome, population count, books on food and diet, charts of the galaxy, and hundreds of other items deemed essential so the next civilization, following this Ischian age, could gain some knowledge of who we were and our accomplishments on Earth. All past civilizations, five that are recorded, have left some markings or records of their accomplishments, whether it be buried in tombs such as this, on tabloids, drawings, or in manuscript form. It is fact that each civilization has left some remembrances of their past, if for no other reason than to brag of their technologies. Thus, this tomb should be considered in the same way of thinking, only here, as we eventually learned, these records were not only of Earth's many civilizations, but the entire history of mankind, here and beyond our solar system. At the far end of the main hall, whose stately architecture measured 300 feet, there stood on a marble stand a book that was encased in glass. Glass was merely a word of description, for it was not of glass or plastic, but a totally strange form of translucent material. This book, open nearly midway, was photographed, and after deciphering it several years later, revealed all previous civilizations, and when man first set foot on this earth 576,000 years ago. These civilizations were listed in the earlier pages of this book. Only these two pages were available due to its sealed confinement, but was enough to learn the basic knowledge of Earth inhabitants from its beginning stages. To give these records some form of updated documentation, I'd like to quote a scripture from your Bible, which reads as follows. When man began to multiply on the face of the ground, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were fair, and they took to wife such of them as they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh, but the days shall be a hundred and twenty years. Translated through universal time and by use of the metric system as... 582,001 years, or a dating of 576,000 years ago to 2001 AD. The Nephilims were on the earth in those days and also afterwards. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. But the days shall be a hundred and twenty years. Translated through universal time and by use of the metric system as 582,001 years or a dating of 576,000 years ago to 2001 A.D. The Nephilims were on the earth in those days and also afterwards, when the sons of God came to the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men that were of old, the men of renown. Genesis chapter 6 This passage reveals the fact that there were men of renown on this earth prior to Adam and Eve, and as far as can be traced. The race of the Nephilims existed or began in the era of 32,000 BC, or 28,000 years prior to Adam's reign. As far as Adam and Eve go, they began their life on earth in the year 4000 BC, and were justly anointed as heads of that new Christian era under God's new ruling. 
which ended as abruptly as it all began. Other than the proven records of the past civilizations that were listed and photographed, the crew felt it was time to concentrate on the mysterious metal discs located in shelved bins at the beginning of the grand hallway. At a closer look of several chosen metal discs, the tiny inscription inscribed on its shiny surface indicated a language totally foreign to anything seen before. Both Sherman Stiles and Amand Bu were well acknowledgeable in the languages of Arabic, Hebrew, Greek, Atlantean, and Mayan, and what was viewed resembled none of those previously studied. Even when the third trip to the tomb was completed, with a member more familiar with the Atlantean language, nothing fit any pattern of an alphabet known to modern man. The discs were strange in themselves, for they were of an unknown metal that was tissue paper thin. If such a disc were crumpled in the hand, as you would paper, its rebound would present its condition back to normal without leaving a trace of ever being crumpled. These discs would not discolor under the heat of a lighter, nor would they absorb any degree of heat from a flame. This meant the metal itself, regardless of its consistency, was totally heat resistant. It could not be mutilated, cut by a razor, or scratched by the cutting edge of a diamond. Immediately it was theorized that this type of metal had to be a relative form of the skins used on alien spacecraft. To make matters even more mysterious, the imprint on the discs in the form of a language, or symbols, was certainly not painted on, etched on, or engraved. The white letters on a grayish background was outstanding, and although it may sound a bit strange, these letters or symbols looked as though they were embedded within the metal itself, or put in a press with metal poured over the imprint. Their sizes varied from a rectangle shape of 7 inches wide to 14 inches long, to oval discs carrying a diameter of 7 inches. As it later turned out after a careful study of this tomb, nearly everything of its contents were in sevens or multiples of seven according to our measurements with all metals of the same consistency. These odd pieces of metal were photographed at random, for if we were to take each one as an individual photograph, the members of this expedition would have to remain in that tomb several months, for there were more than a half million metal sheets and more film would be needed than one could muster up in that quaint land of Egypt. The imprint was not quite what you could call hieroglyphics, for this comprises of mostly inscribed pictures such as seen throughout the land of Egypt. Yet it was in that form for its symbols or individual characterization. To scan these surfaces, one would insist a technician of our present world could never translate them, and if someone could, it may take another century of research. Some of these discs had no inscription on its facing. As a matter of fact, some were just plain sheets of metal that someone forgot to imprint, or had some left over and put them on the racks to get rid of them. This, of course, was surface thinking, for everything there had its distinct purpose. At a much later date, it was learned that these plain discs contained verbal vibrations that were used in one of the machines within the tomb. After nearly six hours of finding out how it operated, such vibrations were then re-recorded by our device, and as research continued over the next four years, the vibrational tones became obvious. Rather than describe these metal plates as to their imprint, I'd suggest you refer to plate number 19, and you will see firsthand what we were up against in the translation that took four years, seven days each week, and 14 hours of each and every day. On the second visitation to the tomb, 1,200 photos were taken of the discs, and this was done on the chance we did not return or were unable to, and such photos and microfilm could be placed at the laboratory for an immediate work up if and when another attempt were made at another time. More of these discs would follow suit in photography. 
Time had nearly expired for this visit due to the painful lacerations of the two members, Jesse Durham and Norman Zeller. The original plans were to remain there more than 24 hours, and as it turned out, we were glad we ceased the operations when we did. The two men, by the time we reached the main opening at the pyramids near Peak, infection had set in and fevers began climbing. The Third Visit It was January 12th, 1977, and the hour was the same and our difficulties began to amount, for we were too frequent a visitor not to be noticed and reported, and knowing a few higher officials of the Egyptian government, we were granted permission to measure and remeasure the exterior of the pyramid on our guise that technical data had to be updated on its structure. To be on hand for this night's journey, we were at the pyramid from 10 a.m., worked around its base, dug a few holes, examined some odd hundred stones, and in general, looked as though we were experts in geometry and metrics. As the guards left, one at a time, we just beckoned that we were staying on to complete our day's chore. To be perfectly honest, by the time the climb started, we were too exhausted to care if we were spotted. From a time of 10 a.m. until after 2 p.m. the following day, our fears lessened on getting caught, but mounted at the very aching thought of climbing 470 up and 980 feet down, all in the same 24-hour period. This time we prepared ourselves with well-packed, compressed to small packets, sleeping bags, added food supplies and water, for a much longer stay, since activity began to stir within the Egyptian officials, every expedition could have been our last, and on this trip we were prepared to examine the machinery. If one could use this if one could use this crude description, take additional photos and expand our excursion to other floors. To accomplish this, each of the four had to be given specific duties for specific areas of the four floors. Time did not allow for the wondering of all who were not engaged in the process of photography. A portable stand had been rigged that would hold a light while pictures were taken. Thus the third trip was underway. While the chosen photographers held the fort at the grand hallway, others were stationed at the opposite end of the hall to inspect the varied machines. During just one part of their stay, much had to be viewed and little time to complete all that had to be done. To tour the complete complex, just five hours were devoted to four sections each and if satisfactorily completed, a move to another station would be required. In reality, all of this was a total impossibility. For if you consider we were trying to review ancient records dating back a half million years in the short time allotted, it could not be done, even with a 20-man crew and all the latest technological instrumentation. As an end result, only a minute portion of this in-depth sanctuary was scanned. Among the artifacts, as we shall call them for the sake of a description, there were stored or displayed, at the last room to the right of the grand hallway, a composite of computers, what we would term visa phones, forms of computer communication, to where still remains an unknown factor, a screen similar to a television set, only encased in the same metal used on all the discs, graphic charts showing the perimeter of creation, not the universe instruments with sensorized plates on a console, and one very strange piece of instrumentation that took many hours to figure out. It could have resembled a giant commercial searchlight, arc light, that is used today to pierce the night skies at grand opening events. This particular machine, and once again of a non-electronic nature, 
meaning that it had no visible wires or underground cables, such as a powerful light may need, behind its transparent metal shield, a form of see-through glass but of metal, you could distinguish the fact it had an odd type filament connected to its throat of the cylinder. Behind this arc-like type of machine and attached to the support and neck stem, there was a metal box, 21 inches by 21 inches by 7 inches, which was in the form of a computer to turn on and off or move it in any direction. The small computer bearing tiny glass or a plastic subject the small computer bearing tiny glass or a plastic substance over tiny holes could be described as the small covers over interior lights that would flash on and off had it been in operation. There were larger plates that were sensorized to the touch and one such plate, by the wave of a hand, started its function. The markings on a faceplate after translation meant anti-gravitator. After further study, it was revealed that this particular man-made device actually created an actual anti-gravitation field ray that would be capable of lifting a stone block of many tons weight in the mid-air, allowing it to be suspended or hover, then set such material down on a precise target. This type of device was undoubtedly the operational machine that was used for the construction of the Great Pyramid, and could be a form of mechan mechanized levitation. How it was, or is powered, must have been concealed within its large and bulky base, which on examination appeared to be seamless and without a weld or divided joint. This machine, as strange as it will seem to all readers, was completely operational at the time of the examination. It was after two hours of scanning, found operable by a wave of a hand over a red lensed inset, to prevent any type of an alarm from being sounded. Its very high-pitched tone only remained on for five short seconds. During this brief interlude, the flashlight held by Sherman Stiles actually lifted from a downward held position to one of pointing directly to the ceiling and for fear of both an interrupted alarm system and the possibility of one of us being suddenly suspended it was cut off. This sound began similar to the low pitch of any violin and each split second the pitch began to increase or wind up to a peaked out crescendo. It was estimated that when this sound finally reached its peak, it would be well beyond the hearing range of the human ear. Although this seems a bit far-fetched, George Makefield of Toronto, Canada, experimented with a similar invention in 1931. His machine was proclaimed by both the British and American governments as a hoax, and could not possibly work. At a demonstration in Ottawa, George Makefield proved his anti-gravitational machine completely left a 1930 Buick sedan six foot off the ground and hold it in suspension two and a half hours. But due to the cost of whatever energy he used, it did not validate it as a functional item still with this demonstration. Both governments stalled their acceptance of the mechanism until Makefield died and took the basis of his invention to the grave with him. He died in poverty, as have other famous inventors. In a similar situation, it was after two hours of scanning, found operable by a wave of a hand over a red-lensed inset. To prevent any type of an alarm from being sounded, its very high-pitched tone only remained on for five short seconds. During this brief interlude, the flashlight, held by Sherman Stiles, actually lifted from a downward-held position to one of pointing directly to the ceiling, and for fear of both an interrupted alarm system and the possibility of one of us being suddenly suspended, it was cut off. 
This sound began similar to the low pitch of any violin, and each split second the pitch began to increase, or wind up to a peaked out crescendo. It was estimated that when the sound finally reached its peak, it would be well beyond the hearing range of the human ear. Although this seems a bit far-fetched, George Makefield of Toronto, Canada, experimented with a similar invention in 1931. His machine was proclaimed by both the British and American governments as a hoax and could not possibly work. At a demonstration in Ottawa, George Makefield proved his anti-gravitational machine could completely lift a 1930 Buick sedan six foot off the ground and hold it in suspension two and a half hours. But due to the cost of whatever energy he used, did not validate it as a functional item still with this demonstration. Both governments stalled their acceptance of the mechanism until Makefield died and took the basis of his invention to the grave with him. He died in poverty as have other famous inventors. In a similar situation, a George Worrell of Philadelphia experimented with an identical machine in 1937 where he had recorded the sound and vibrations of a violin's high C, then magnified it 20,000 times. This unheard sound and vibration lifted a solid form of concrete weighing five tons. It remained suspended until he took possession of the violin once again and struck a discord. Instead of the block lowering gradually, as did the Buick car, it crashed to the laboratory floor. Worrell was on the right track, but before perfecting his instrument, he died. Thus, such a device was known during our early 1930s here in this country, in Canada, and to have experienced it at the tomb comes as no great surprise. Many such elaborate inventions have surfaced in the past two generations, but due to skepticism by those who control government spending, as well as private investors, Almost as many inventions die on the vine without the general public having the slightest inkling of what was accomplished by many world greats. Now that this device was finally discovered on how the pyramid was built, by the use of more than one machine, the question remains, who built it and who the inventors were for such an unequaled machine? Another article worth an honorable mention is rated almost as strange if not more so. Its basic description is more mystifying than all other myths of the past and is one that should have been witnessed in the future of the 25th century and not an artifact of thousands of years past. This item, or whatever one chooses to call it, was a giant sized metallic ring carrying a diameter of 25 feet with a tunnel-like depth of 12 feet. At a quick glance one could term it crudely as a large piece of underground sewer pipe cut off from its regular length. Only this conduit was of an unusual metal rather than concrete. The exterior, and being at least four inches thick, had a shiny smooth surface similar to the skin of a flying saucer. Again, such a metallic surface could not be marred by any type of tool and every metal surface exposed within the tomb revealed no paint or dye whatsoever. On the far right, as you would face its front, and this was difficult to determine, there was a similar computer box to the one round on the anti-gravitational machine. Because of the previous experience of high-frequency sounds, this machine remained the unknown factor as to its operation, for no one dared to activate it. On the inner surface, the structuring was somewhat different. The entire inner rim showed tiny thin lines, beginning at the outside lip of the ring and ran in a tight continuous spiral that ended at the opposite lip, twelve foot through its depth. These thin lines were cut into the metal at least two inches, as far as could be determined and between these spiral lines, its walls were of a rough glazed surface and far from smooth. The floor was as round as the outside shell, except for one particular point, 
At a point midway, there was a horizontal bridging that was connected to each side of the normal curvature of the bottom. It looked, for all appearances, as a platform where one might stand prior to the machine being activated. With the help of our own technical engineers, and then others over the next two years, the theory that was expounded upon regarding this unusual ring could be only expressed two ways. From its design of the spiral rings within a ring, it could be a form of a time machine, or a transferal ring, of teleportation, placing a person from one vantage point to another by a rearranging of the physical atom structure. Refer to the book Beyond Our Galaxy and The Universal Oneness by this same author for a clearer explanation. In studying 19 close-up photos of this unusual ring, the answer would have to lie with one of the two theories. As far as our technologies go, such a ring of unusual metal could serve no other specific purpose, and still a time machine seems fictional. Another item of an ancient artifact was found in a room enclosure, but had an unlocked metal door. This chamber room was totally empty except for one miniature-sized pyramid boldly placed in the center of the floor. It was not picked up, but it was measured. From all measurements, it was a scaled-down replica of the Pyramid Giza, yet not an actual model as one would expect. This miniature pyramid, measuring 7.62 inches of each side of its base, and a height of 4.86 inches, did represent a replica since the period its pyramid itself was 762 feet by 486 feet in height. Its miniaturized structure was of a trans-illuminated material, similar to a pyramid built of solid plastic. From its flat apex, one thin wire protruded upward 2.86 inches and this wire was the identical thickness of a piano wire of the thinnest degree. There were no buttons, sensorized discs, or portals of tiny lights. From all outward appearances it served no obvious purpose. But then the obvious is not always the real intent. After four years of studying the four, four photos, this device still remains a mystery, totally unsolved. The Revealing Records A total of six visits were finally made to this great tomb, with a span of time from June of 1976 to May of 1977. Within the sixth visitation being the last until posterity, it was extremely doubtful that a seventh could be arranged at that time and certainly not at this time. Suspicion of this expedition and our intent began to mount by many agitated Egyptian officials, especially since members of this crew were spotted but disappeared suddenly from sight high on the south wall of the pyramid. Our Egyptian friends may be slow in figuring out our reasons for repeated trips up the outer walls, but they are far from being stupid. The fact remained that when any member was being sought, regardless of the night, day, or night hour, regardless of the day or night hour, no one could be found, and to them this was highly unusual. Any further excuses regarding a longer stay or the purchase of more film and food would have aroused the least of the alert officials and members would have been followed. From these half dozen encounters into the tomb, 2,700 microfilms were taken of the records. A laboratory was established on the remote outskirts of Bonn, Germany, where these films were both developed and magnified 250 times until the blurred effect prevented an accurate translation. It was not until November of 1979 that all translation was completed in rough form to be more refined over the years that may follow. To even begin such a detailed and tedious task, some basis of an alphabet had to be established, whether they were letters or symbols. 
Certain letters that appeared more often than others were listed in certain groups of other letters. Symbols that resemble triangles first meant pyramid, but then sentences were constructed. This word changed to mean structures, meaning no particular structure as the pyramid. One basic clue was a letter symbol of a semi-reversed S, but with more of a middle stem. This eventually came to mean center. The round symbols with an inner semi-round circle, looking very much like the drawing of a human eye looking upward at its top, meant planet or earth with its large hole at our north pole, as per Admiral Byrd's discovery. Attaching these letters and odd-shaped symbols and placing them in line for a sentence structure proved out in some cases and three completely off track in others that were thought to have a definite meaning. The symbolization that was discovered near the beginning stages of translation resembled that of the Atlantean language, and from that basis it moved more rapidly, even though there was only a slight similarity to this language at hand. Petri de la Rue, the French bibliosceptor that headed the team of five other prominent men of the identical Calabria, see credits, and who were the masters of ancient languages dating from the oldest to our present civilization with its many subdivisions that are interrelated. From picture over, the following translation was taken from a microfilm desk. These are four phot photographs from picture over. The following translation was taken from a microfilm disc. These are four paragraphs on the actual disc that are confined a two inch width and a quarter inch depth. Translation Knowledge of Urms Seven openings form one of its central magnetics. Two at its mid regions, one of the east quadrant, two at magnetic opposite, one mid ocean quadrant, subsurface dwelling at east quadrant and mid of sphere, mid of circumference, inner inhabitant of solar, five hundred on one thousand, base of fission energy at base of sphere. The actual translation they wrote down here with the interjection is knowledge of Urms seven openings form one of its central magnetics North Pole two at its mid regions Yucatan region one of the east quadrant the United States, two at magnetic opposite, South Pole, one mid-ocean quadrant, Atlantis, sub-surface dwelling at east quadrant and mid of sphere, mid of circumference, area of South America, inner inhabitant of solar 500 on 1000, meaning the inner civilizations have been inhabited 500,000 solar years base of fission energy at base of sphere. This refers to the Earth's liquid core or inner energy. Cavities carved by light for entrance beyond structures, meaning that the inner inhabited cavities were carved by laser beams around the cities as inner connecting. The same method was described in the Rampa book, The Hermit. Seven of seventh of fission and sixty on three by divided atoms meaning that of the 70 cities, 7 have energy of liquid fission, and 63 use the separated atoms, neutrons, and photons. Line of departure guided by force and laser. This carries the mean in OFA, special force field, used in pushing spacecraft out from within with the laser guide in its path. Power for liquid light, fission, drawn from central 5 on 5 plans, distance of 25 polar measures, energy extracted by force field and cultivated.
All inner structures obtained by inner ore of inner core, refined by laser nine of ninety of rotation by lift of levitation. All structures still mined from within and lifted into place by a laser beam. After two and a half years of intense research, scanning the 2,700 microfilm, enlarging those that showed an immediate promise of easier translation, studying the crude maps and other related data, much was learned even though these photofilms were taken at random from that historical metal library. Among such translations we learned of our previous civilizations, as I indicated earlier, their language and their accomplishments while they remained at peace and did little to disturb the natural element of Earth's atmosphere or its central core of energy. We learned that the Egyptians were the direct descendants of the Atlantean race, how both lived as civilized people and the name changes that took place over the thousands of centuries of the countries where they existed. twenty seven hundred microfilm clips taken at the tomb reveal man's supreme power. The twenty seven hundred microfilm clips taken at the tomb reveal much about our alien visitors and their teachings, and in addition goes into an in depth perception of man's unseen powers in an effort to awaken man from his earthly bounds and limitations. God created earth, and on the face of its globe this message was written. Man, being self-blinded to the meaning of universal laws and his purpose in this human race, was unable to tend what has been written, and cannot understand its meaning for his own lifetime. A select few of our ancients having an insight into our universe interpreted it to others but the majority of our incompetent masses sneer at facts that they cannot or refuse to acknowledge as truth. Since man is a spirit in a human form and is a direct descendant of God and alien, he neglects the fact that all are born equal and whatever development he achieves within a short lifespan is as he and he alone has made it. To scoff at humans of superior intelligence, coming from other planets, is merely the expression of the ignorance they have so vigorously cultivated. Both man and alien have the same capacity of thought waves, and both are a part of all universal powers. For the sake of stressing this point of a supreme power, I'd like to quote from the book The Mysterious Universe by Sir James Jeans, who wrote the following regarding man's knowledge. All those bodies which compose the mighty frame of the world have not any substance without the mind. As we live in the unforgettable age of progress in science, knowledge becomes our most important goal, while belief in God and the universal mind falls secondary. Man has always probed beyond his immediate realm of conscious thinking and gives life little or no thought to the power that lies within the mind and its universal purpose that could answer his whys or what lays behind, lays beyond. Albert Einstein has always stressed his belief that man should regard time as another dimension in which all of the present should be a preparatory experiment for the dimension that will follow. Einstein's renowned theories have led him to regard the mind as the ultimate in reality and the key that unlocks the hidden mysteries of the universe. We live on a revolving ball in space, located in the star-filled orbit from Pluto to Mercury. We know these starry planets, their history, their approximate birth, and their distance from each other, and we have guesstimates as to their demise. We are constantly probing space, designing great ships to penetrate the heavens, satellites for laboratory existence, communications with visitors of the far-reaching areas of the universe, yet, as ironic as it may seem, we have yet to probe the mysteries of our own mind, leaving this stratum of the consciousness, which was the richest vein of all knowledge, to wither like the leaf of a tree. 
The law of your mind is also the law of the universe and the law of belief, meaning that if you truly believe in belief itself, all things are totally possible. For your mind is an inseparable entity of the universal spirit, where one cannot exit. The law of your mind is also the law of the universe and the law of belief, meaning that if you truly believe in belief itself, all things are totally possible. For your mind is an inseparable entity of the universal spirit, where when one cannot exist without the other. Therefore you must bear in mind always that the law of life is the missing link between the universal mind and the creator. Thusly, the power that now lies within your subconscious is all supreme, as practiced by the ancients of previous civilizations and eras, and those who brought such a knowledge to earth more than half a million years ago. If the powers of the mind are known today by our scientists, researchers, prophets and members of the psychic cult, who can play judge and jury on the data taken from these secret records? Teleportation Teleportation, used in ancient times, is very much a part of man's supreme power, for it deals with the power of the mind, and only of the mind, to an advanced degree. The word teleportation, in any layman's language, refers to an instant transference of a body or object from any given place to another point of time or space without the use of a physical force of a visible tracement. It is the process in which a body seems to dematerialize and reappear at some distant point. Similar to the science fiction stories of the time machine of the motion picture Star Trek, where people are teleported to Earth from a spacecraft. The records indicate that regardless of any dematerialization process, whether it is accomplished by instrumentation, by higher technologies, or involved in a spiritual transformation, it is only a matter than it is only a matter than can be accomplished by a rearrangement of atom structures, whether it be in a human form or of a solid material. Teleportation is therefore a process that takes place within a billionth of a second. The details of it working under forms of instrumentation are beyond the comprehension of present man. With all transferals of a body or an object, there is error and uncalculated dangers by both earthlings and humanoid. Teleportation is only accomplished in split-second timing, and beyond that billionth of the second, the transferal is lost forever. As an example worth remembering, the teleportation process, if delayed, once it begins, could transfer one into a different time dimension, or if the separation of atoms are used for entering a solid wall, such a hesitation of a split second could imprison one within that wall through all eternity. The records of this tomb reveal two forms of teleportation. One is through varied instrumentation, where rays of light are played on the body or subject, using liquid light fission. The complexity of an atom separator and a magnetic force field for mere seconds. Then the instant process begins on the body or object in which it begins to rapidly fade from sight to be reconstructed at a different destination at the very same moment, regardless of distance. If you are familiar with the television series Star Trek, this form of teleportation is somewhat accurate, but the delay shown in this filming is not accurate. The entire process of teleportation only lasts from its beginning to the complete transfer a total of three seconds. One of these three, only one billionth of a second, is required to create the temporary rearrangement of the structural atoms. As you are well aware, everything that exists in the universe, including solid forms, a living human, or a spiritual soul, consists of an atom composite or an atom structure. Your body and your soul are atoms, but vary in their density, and since atoms are matter, they can never be destroyed. They can accept change from one form to another, and they can be rearranged on a temporary basis. 
but they cannot be destroyed. Atoms that are also the breath of all life can be changed from the invisible to solids. They can be a human one day and a spiritual soul the next. They can be split for the use of explosive power, atom bomb, or they can be separated for the use of perpetual energy. Thus, from this microscopic, invisible particle comes life and all that we witness here, on Earth and in the universe. The alien, and or those great ancients, use the fullest power of the mind. They use these atoms as knowledge for energy, teleportation, cranial intervision, mind reading, spacecraft, powers to heal, telekinesis, levitation, and the elongation of their own lifespan to more than 1,000 years, Earth count. Teleportation, other than with the help of instrumentation, has been applied just through the powers of the universal mind. When one has an out-of-body experience, he has actually touched on a form of dematerialization. Except in this experience you become a soul entity and lack the technology to commit your actual body to this very same process. There are, in a few well-hidden archives of our leading institutes, records of transpiratory force, or flight marked top secret. Our government and their institute agencies do have detailed records that list the disappearances of large ships, fully cargoed and crewed, people who have been seen to suddenly light up and glow like an incandescent lamp, then immediately fade from sight. Some Untold Secrets in the continuance of this vast study and the process of evaluating all that has now been photographed from these metal discs, I must explain that only a small portion of the findings can be published or released for this particular writing. Much of the data found relating to the higher technologies can never be released to this generation as long as apathy rules the thinking of our masses. I am referring to such archive data pertaining to the precise formula for telekinesis, human teleportation, the source of liquid light here on Earth, the art of levitation, and the advanced stages of transpiratory force. To mention little of revealing the exactness of our inner Earth entrances where civilizations do exist in our Earth in this very era of time. Also, Semyes told of the underground cities under big parts of the jungle in Brazil and else, still not known in a In nearly all centuries past, people have always taken a dim view of the many legends passed down by their ancestors, from Indian folklore, stories from Plato, the tales of Jules Verne, or the dramatic esca escapades of our own Orson Welles regarding sea monsters, little green men from outer space, or the abominable snowman that turned skepticism into a horrified reality. The majority of our world's disbelievers are not completely without some reservations, for many of the unexplainable phenomena are believed when we give reference to the Mayans, who tunneled their way into the vast depths of our mountain ranges, caverns, and the inner crevices to establish their inner cities beyond all surface tribulations and the declining influence of the human race who rule the outside world. Regardless of beliefs or disbeliefs concerning the hollow earth theory, not only have legends persisted of the golden gods who dwell from within, but also we have a confirmation of this from the microfilms that indicate seven actual openings and seven large cavern cavities far below our surface. In their days, this advanced race of superior intelligence gave reference to our days of disasters, marking it for the Ischian age prior to its final demise. For this reason alone, preparations were made for a safer existence by the Mayans and Atlanteans, within the earth and no longer upon it. We are talking of an era dating back some twenty-five to thirty thousand years. There are, so far as we have been able to determine from the Mayan maps, these entrances into the inner earth lead directly into the cavern cities far below the earth's surface. Since and perhaps even prior to these Mayans, 
Many more openings were indicated by other civilizations, but they were either admitted by the Mayan hieroglyphics or kept from public knowledge for specific reasons. This particular race was quite secretive and seldom released date concerning their findings of their type technologies and may have purposely eliminated the major information concerning the many openings due to people's whims of curiosity. None of the man transcripts bore out precise locations of their residency, their underground cities, or dates of their achievements. From the microfilmed metal discs, we were fortunate in learning the whereabouts of at least seven major openings. Had it not been for this discovery in the tomb, more years than necessary would have to be devoted to intensified research in random areas over the entire face of this globe. As a matter of fact, these openings may never have been found due to Earth's change of quakes, flooded land, and the shifting of surfaces. At the time when these metal discs were laid to rest in this tomb, our Earth's surface had no resemblance to what is known or shown in our present day maps. These cavities in our Earth, which I am touching on under strange esoteric mysteries, are somewhat different than the expected caverns that admit tourists. These cavities below the Earth's crust contain a vastness capable of housing several major cities in one area. As an example, the cavern at the base of the entrance from the north, according to the ancient map, could very well house the entirety of New York and Chicago, yet leave enough room for vast acreage of agricultural fields. In South America, an opening is located at a latitude of 70 degrees with a longitude of 10 degrees. This cavern lies in the neighborhood of a 312-mile depth or 302 miles into the outer mount mantle. For the area involved in the continent of Russia, there is an indicated opening, breathing hole, south of Tombu and north of Varanzia, at a latitude of 90 degrees and a longitude of 30 degrees plus. The depth of this cavern was listed at 1,788,159 and 9 of 10. In this terminology, the meaning is in cubits for a depth of 508 miles. China has a location marked at a latitude of 110 degrees and a longitude of 25 degrees, which would place you near the city of Quailin. There is a recording in cubits that figure this cavern depth at 277 miles down from our outer crust, or 267 miles into the outer mantle. Unfortunately, the fourth opening is marked at a longitude of 40 degrees and a latitude of the same, thus pinpointing an area of the mid-Atlantic. The fifth known cavity of the inner Earth lies at a longitude of 42 degrees and a latitude not exceeding 77 degrees, give or take a degree due to land shifts over the past 200,000 years. This indicates one of our northeastern states of these United States. According to all that has been recorded in the archives of this tomb, we have here on this earth twin worlds that are either matching or they are of two separate entities, and the latter I prefer to believe. For those of you who remain doubtful of the possibility of a twin world, let one stress the point that beneath our very surface there are thousands of miles of tunnels, dozens of submerged lakes, hundreds or more miles in underground rivers, enormous caverns that are within our ten-mile crust. There are the volcanoes that extend their massive shafts to depths of eight to twelve miles into the Earth's abyss, with canal routes, passageways piercing the depths of four hundred miles. Burned-out volcanoes are a natural network of passages and caverns that eventually lead to the deeper portions of our inner earth and in some areas of the interior, vast cities could have been built. Three thousand years ago in India, transcripts were uncovered that strongly indicated our earth was inhabited by space vehicles whose occupants existed below our surfaces. 
These same uncovered records of India revealed the proof that serial photography has existed for more than 200,000 years and from several ancient films. The aliens were featured in one-piece suits of a metal material with headgear that was in advance of any spacesuit contrived by our engineers at NASA. Commander Paulo Strauss, an officer in the Brazilian Navy, believes in the theory that most of the flying saucers originate from our Earth's interior, as well as some from beyond our galaxy, which was their original origin. A famed Russian explorer by the name of Nicholas Rorsch claims that Lhasa, the capital of Tibet, was definitely connected by tunnels with Shambhala, a name given to one of the main cities of sub subterranean chambers. More of the caverns in Tibet and what is inside of them was described of Lobsang Rampa, Sea Cave of the Ancient. Such a tunnel in China would be in a forbidden territory and according to all visible records it is one of the many that are now closed due to landslides and blockages of varied sorts. This particular opening described by Rourke is also indicated on these metal discs within the tomb, thus crediting him with the sound theory. There are at present an abundance of existing tunnels in South America, Yucatan, the deserts of Egypt, and in the limestone vaults below northern Russia, India, Indochina, many regions of the United States, and throughout the whole of the African continent. Such tunnels, as are described by the Mayans and the Agarthians, are in effect breathing tubes for the inner caverns, with access to and from the varied surfaces throughout the world. The number of openings are guided by the size of the cavern and the area covered by an inner civilization, thus proven that South America features more openings, other than direct passages, due to the main stem of caverns. Many of the tunnels that have been found are remnants of the Atlantean age, and the Atlanteans who originally colonized in the mountain regions of South America and the valleys of the Yucatan. For all details concerning life below this surface, I refer you to this author's book, The Incredible Cities of Inner Earth, which is based on an actual expedition into our Earth's abyss of a distance of 320 miles. This privately sponsored expedition did find inner complexes and sustaining life not similar to ours of the surface. Esoteric Knowledge The Pyramid of Giza is but one that stands alone as a structure of prophecy, but is not the only existing pyramid on the face of this earth. In reality, there are many dozens of pyramids throughout Asia and in scattered parts of Europe, in South America, amidst our famed Bermuda Triangle, in the areas of Yucatan, Mexico, and at locations yet to be discovered. Of these hundreds that are frequently seen around the world, only six actually match the size of Giza. Of these magnificent seven, one you know of it positioned at the gateway of the western Egyptian desert of the Libyan plains of the Sahara, known as Giza. The second is indicated to be in the Kunlea Shah Mountains, near Chezam in the country of China, known as Koklik, area. This is more confirmed in the last years when this Chinese society has opened up more for foreigner researchers. The third pyramid is underground. Its peak is 100 feet below sea level at Easter Island, approximately 2,000 miles due west of Saltoc, Argentina. The fourth is midway in the Bermuda Triangle buried to a depth of nearly 400 feet at the level of its top. The fifth lies in Mexico, at the northeast point of the Yucatan Peninsula. The sixth is indicated in the area of South American near Lijado Bananal, Brazil, also stated by some museum. This location also carries a marking that indicates a descending tunnel of approximately 65 degrees to depths actually unknown. 
but the passage ends at the edge of one of the larger inner caverns of Earth. A remarkable thing occurs when you draw lines to and from these destinations, for after a little juggling, all lines eventually form giant triangles, or global pyramids. Each of these seven pyramids have one common bond, in that they are, or were, interconnected below the Earth's surface, in the form of what was referred to as trans-tubes or light vehicles, light meaning their power source. This vast and complex network of undersurface tunnels is like any engineering feat we are capable of de designing or even comprehending. We are talking of the original network having had an excess of 300,000 miles, whereas now its vastness has been re reduced to a mere 32,000 miles due to underground and surface quakes, flooding and varied land shifts that would virtually destroy many areas of these inner earth tunnels. These tunnels were built in many stages over several civilizations, and they had a definite purpose. From all indications, these tunnels are not of the size you would normally imagine, nor could they be compared with our city-to-city -city underwriter crossings. These are relatively small, and it is a fair estimate to assume they are no more than six foot in diameter and are only semi-round, meaning the bottom to have a flat surface. They are perfectly straight with only a few slowly angled curves to help change the course of direction. Within this network there are markings for 77 stations or portal exits. And one was indicated at the tomb below the Great Pyramid of Giza. The semi-crude drawings show only two horizontal markings, one for each side of the tube tunnel. Below midway of the sides, it is our assumption these markings are relative to their power source, which was already recorded as liquid light. If liquid light is their source of power for these trans tubes, such as technology, had to come from those beyond our solar system. In view of the fact that most spacecraft are powered with the same liquid energy, with the use of a liquid light energy source, these tunnel vehicles would be capable of speeds in excess of 1500 miles per hour and with direct routing under the surface. Time would not be a major factor to travel from Cairo to the plains of South America. In short, such a small jaunt could be accomplished within a two-hour range. These inner trans tubes were apparently designed only for the immediate transportation from pyramid to pyramid and the remaining 70 portals around the world. This means that according to their size, they were not designed to carry freight of excessive baggage. They were not meant to transport slaves, run messages are used for mere thrill rides. The diameter of these vehicles were not more than four and a half feet of its overall measurement, thus allowing enough free airspace on all sides at these tremendous speeds. One thing is not clear, however, we do not know whether these vehicles ran on some sort of a rail, or if it remained suspended above the flat surface of the tunnel bottom. Something similar was told from a direct contact to all people like civilization, that an English family had in the 70s had built underground caves where special crafts run in high speeds, obviously carried on a magnetic field with small clearance to the tube walls. R-O-A-N-M. The headquarters of the high priests who may still operate these trans tubes come from one of the many well-hidden caverns far below our surface. From a city they call Tain, Abila, which in translation means City of Eternal Light. From those crude maps, it should be located in the outer mantle with its entrance close to the South American continent. Although there is no substantiation of this fact, it is assumed that these priests are the last of the Mayan race and are the innkeepers of the records in the transcontinental transportation system. It is also a belief, as long as we are theorizing, that the Mayans control the secret tomb, update its recordings, and care for its maintenance. The full purpose is, of course, not registered on these metal discs, and for obvious reasons. Once again, in its theory of form, belief has it that these priests are also responsible for many disappearances of our scientists and others of an esteemed background. Among those who have disappeared rather suddenly, and of mysterious circumstances are as follows. 
Nathan Doubleday, a scientist who had perfected a modern-day force field. His disappearance occurred after he had entered one of the smaller caves in the northeast portion of Yucatan on April 19, 1937. Doubleday was renowned in a specific field of magnetism and experiments led him to Yucatan in search of special metals deep within the crest caverns. He was never found since that day and all searchers revealed no trace of a human body in that limited area of that one cavern. Another such person was Albert Newell, a noted scientist in the field of telekinesis who had devoted nearly 20 years to these technologies and had achieved a major breakthrough. Newell left Chicago on May 3rd to journey to the Yucatan area and divulged portions of his findings with a fellow scientist who had accomplished sufficient power in the same realm of thought. Projection. Both men were last seen traveling northeast from the Yucatan border on July 2nd. Their car vanished without a trace and neither were heard of since that date and time. It is the Yucatan area where residents of the inner earth can be found, emerging and disappearing, leaving everyone to more mysterious wonderment. These are but two of many who have faded into the heavy midst of that questionable countryside, never leaving the slightest clue beyond the point where they were last seen.